<laughs> That's much better. Can hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? That's good. Fantastic. Good morning. Uh, bon, bon, dia. bon dia. Bon dia. Bon dia. That's the only part of my talk that will be in Portuguese. Sorry, Why? that's the best I could do. <laughs> you should have tried. I, I could have tried, it wouldn't have gone well. You should have trained. A gente consegue aumentar o volume um pouquinho? So, so, this is our group. Hello, team. That was, that, that's the kind of response I expect. From yes. I, 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 I definitely, I'm, I'm, I'm also very excited in having you. So, they look to the side. They're not excited. Okay, they will improve. I hope so. Yes, um, you know, so. you remember all the other, all the other meetings. This improves. Well, I also have to. So, remember, it's first thing in the morning for you guys. Really, it's still very early. You know, it's. it's uh, in fact, I think it is hypoglycemia because yeah. they don't have lunch. You don't have lunch. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's in okay. way of your lunch. I think some of them want to make surgery. Maybe we start training right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is surgery. Okay, <laughs> so we go for our next yes. lecture in Global uh, yeah. has, has everybody either got sight of the slides or got them on their laptop or something? Can you see? Todo mundo está com algum trequinho desse? E consegue ver para acompanhar? Yes. Okay. Couple of things before we get going. One, Ooh. and I'm going to be clicking along here. You guys follow along. I'll sort of share next when you have to go on to the next bit. Okay, we managed this. Um, two, as I said, I'm doing this in English. If anybody does not understand something I've said, because trust me, my students struggle when they're listening to me in a first language. You guys, I don't know. Um, if you don't understand, stop me. I will try and explain, or Silka will try and translate. Okay, don't don't drift off and fall asleep because you can't pay attention because I'm talking nonsense. Okay, I might be talking nonsense. Not intended. Okay. That's not intended consequence. Okay, however, what we'll do is I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe top. Then we're going to have some discussion. Yes, I know. Nobody wanted to do that either. Everyone happy? Okay. Ready to go? You're Give me a thumbs up. Up. No, nobody. Okay, one of you. Vocês têm muita dificuldade para entender inglês ou não? Ele falando? Não? Ele está falando devagarzinho o suficiente? Vocês entenderam? Qualquer problema a gente interrompe e explica. Ok? É só dar um grito. We are ready. Then we will go on. Right. I am Dr. Andrew Morris. I am very lucky to have been working with Silke and Karina for the last, what, three and a half years now? Um, I am here today in my capacity as a microbiologist, okay? I work very closely with our genitourinary medicine, uh, so sexual health here, uh, as well as lots of other parts of infectious diseases. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is the global problem we have with gonorrhea, what I will talk about in this lecture as gonococci. Okay, um, some, of you, have you, some of you heard of the term gonococci before? Yes? No? Well, okay, you will have by the end of this. So if we go, okay. on, to the, if we go on to the first slide, um, just to, right. we're going to talk about the fact that this is a global problem. A lot of the things I will talk about will be from the point of view of England, because that's where I am. But 
you can't look at infectious and sexually transmitted specifically diseases just from one point of view. So I'll talk a lot about things in England because that's what I see a lot of, but we're going to talk about how this relates to the whole world. I'm going to talk about drug resistance because it is antibiotic resistance that is a big problem and is causing us so many issues. There are about five slightly boring mechanisms slides that I will try and get through without putting you to sleep. I put them in because you need to understand the scope of the problem. Okay. And we need to know that the, the increasing spread of gonorrhea and the increasing spread of antibiotic resistance are coming together to give us a massive, potentially unstoppable problem. And that we all need to do something about it. And that's what we'll have a big discussion about at the end. Next slide. Okay, I want to start with a case. This is all based essentially on real patient. So, follow along. We have a 22-year-old man, and he comes to the Genito Urinary Medicine Clinic this morning. Okay, so he's coming to see you, future sexual health doctors of the future. He meets you, and when you say, why are you here, he says he's been experiencing what he describes as a milky discharge from the tip of his penis. He's finding it harder to pass urine, so it, it's more difficult for him to go to the toilet. But it's not painful. The only pain he has is a dull ache in his testy. Okay? He's come to you because he is worried he has a sexually transmitted infection. Okay? When you take a history, so you ask him some questions, his last sexual contact was this morning, but literally just before he came to see you. He had a busy day already. With his current male partner, he performed anal sex, did not wear a condom for them. As far as he knows, his current partner not complaining of any symptoms, but they, he, he didn't notice anything, the partner hasn't said anything. Prior to this, so before today, he only just come back from Australia, so he's been back in country for two days, well, nearly three days now. Um, whilst he was there, he had, on his last day, so about four days ago in real time, he had had sex with a man he met whilst on holiday. He uh, performed anal sex and performed oral sex on the man. He also didn't use any condoms for that. Again, he doesn't really have very much in the way of contact information. He's not going to be able to give this guy a ring and ask him, but uh, he doesn't remember the man having any symptoms. So, the, you, when you ask the guy, he's never had an STI, a sexually transmitted infection, before. He's had all of the routine vaccinations we would expect him to have had. So, he's been vaccinated for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and human papillomavirus, HPV. He has been tested for HIV before, and that test was negative. He does not recreationally use drugs. He doesn't smoke but he admits to drinking alcohol quite a bit, his word. Okay. What would you, as the doctor, be thinking about here? Are there any things that you would worry about this guy having? Bearing in mind he has got symptoms, got a discharging penis. You could refer to the title of the lecture if you want to guess where we're going. I mean... They're very bashful, quite a shy group, very retiring. Um, so, what do we think? Is there a slight chance for this patient to have sexual transmitted disease? 
there is a slight chance. Do you think he might? Do you if think he, he has, has If he had symptoms, do you think it is worth to investigate? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Do you have any? Do you have any diseases you think you would test him for? If you had to pick to test him for something, what would you want to test him for? What do you think he might have? I think no, based, on, based on the title of the lecture, you can guess one, surely. Okay, we will test him for gonorrhea, but... Uh, Let's test him, yes, uh, test him for gonorrhea. Are there any other STIs you think would be worth testing? Always. There's got to be one that you would all think about. I don't know anybody in your we age range. Right? test HIV? We always test HIV. You guys will. We do. You guys should. Certainly, I bet I know. I've met Prof. Alexandre. We always test. People been horrified not? that they're not saying test for HIV. What? So Prof. Alexandre is somewhere. He's gone. He's gone very cold. He's going. They've learned nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Chlamydia? Look at me, Andrew. I'm a Chlamydia? GNT. Huh? Chlamydia, anybody? You've got, anybody? You've got the concept of chlamydia before. Would we? Oh, they're very, they're very sheltered, your students. And the other one is syphilis. Syphilis. Okay? Syphilis. Syphilis. You would have to test him for all four of those. And there okay. is a very good reason for that. Okay? And we will come on to that. Okay, so we test him for all the four diseases. Yeah. How would you test him? What do you think we could do to test him for these? Test. Serologies? Yeah, so a blood test. Yeah, that would certainly be for HIV and, and syphilis, yeah. Bacterioscopy? Well, yeah, yeah, if he's got goo coming out of his penis. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, if you can see something, blob it. Are there any other parts of him you think might be worth swabbing? What's he as been I'm doing? In ENT, as I'm in the ENT, I would say the throat. Good point. Yes. <laughs> if he has performed oral sex on somebody and you think that he might have, that person might have given him an infection somewhere else, then yeah, you've got to test his pharynx, you've got to test his throat. I would also say given that we can't be 100% certain where he's got this from, I would also test his anus as well, okay? So we would take swabs from penis, his throat, and his anus, okay? Okay. Quite invasive, not? It is, and this is going to come back to another big problem we're going to talk about in a minute. When do you think we could give him the results of his test? How long do you think he's going to have to wait? Here. Well, could he wait here for the result of the test? Or are we going to have to take a blood test and make him go away? Two to three days. And as you don't have any agenda for an appointment in two months? Ooh. Okay. Ooh. No, okay, better not. No. Uh, uh, I don't know. Here, I think okay. that's the next day. I think when for not? the next day. I, I, I will tell you, so I have I have a slide you don't have, okay, because I know what happens next. Ah. Okay. So, listen very carefully. You offer the man a blood test for HIV and for syphilis, which he agrees to. Take swabs of the discharge coming out of his urethra, and you take swabs from his pharynx and from his anus. You ask him to wait... Now, we're very lucky in England. We have a genitalia urinary medicine service where we can do this whilst you wait. You ask him to wait, and 20 minutes later, microscopy and gram stain, 
of the discharge from his urethra shows the presence of neutrophils, white blood cells, polynormal cells, and gram-negative dipocalci, which suggests a gonorrhea infection. Based on this, you tell the yeah, patient sure. you need to give them antibiotics. So you give him an injection, intramuscular, of cetriaxone, and a course of doxycycline to be taken twice a day for seven days. The man agrees to get the results of his other tests for chlamydia, HIV, and syphilis by text message on his phone, uh, which is one of the services we offer, and to return in one week for a test of cure. So it's a test to make sure the gonorrhea is gone away. Okay? Okay. So, yeah. Does that make sense okay. to everybody? Yeah. Okay, so we very lucky. I, I'm very lucky I'm in a situation where I can have a patient find that information out straight away from the patient. Yeah, he'll have to wait a couple of days for the other tests, but we know where he is. We have his phone number, call him up, send him a text message. Great, and those patients come back in. Their partners don't have to know. We will ask him to tell his partner. Okay. Fantastic, great, wonderful system. So why have we got such a big problem? Next slide. Right. Some exciting facts about gonorrhea. Right. Mm. Gonorrhea is caused by a bacterium called Neisseria gonorrhea. It's basically a cousin of the bacterium that we associate with a lot of meningitis, Neisseria meningitidis, the meningococcus. Okay? If you get gonorrhea and recover from it, you cannot make antibodies against it. So you don't get lifelong protection. If you get a cold and you recover from it, you will have lifelong immune protection from that strain of the cold. It doesn't work with gonorrhea. You can never generate meaningful antibody response to it. So you can't become protected from gonorrhea by being infected with it. It's not like measles or something like that. As a result, we really don't have any hopes of a vaccine for it. No vaccine. The only way to get rid of it is with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Primary infection. So if you get gonorrhea, the only way to get gonorrhea is to have sex with somebody who has gonorrhea. If your boyfriend or girlfriend rings you up and says, um, I've got gonorrhea, you should get yourself tested, I got it from a toilet seat. They're lying to you. They had sex with somebody else. Break up with them. Don't actually, don't. You can only get gonorrhea from somebody who has gonorrhea. You can't get it from the environment. People to people. Things that make it more likely are if the person has symptoms. You're all thinking, I wouldn't have sex with somebody who had us ripping out of their reproductive system. You'd be surprised how many people after a few drinks go, oh, okay then. Um, but that's the world. Um, but the important thing to remember is that you can get gonorrhea anywhere you've got mucous tissue. So you can get it on your penis or your vagina, your cervix, your anus, throat, or even in your eye. Gonorrhea in your eye. That's something to think about. Okay? Most infections are of the urethra. Men will 90% of men who get infected will show symptoms. 50% of women who get infected, roughly, will show symptoms. And in history, back in the olden days, this led to a belief 
that gonorrhea was spread to men by immoral women. Thankfully, we now know that's not true. Okay, but it does give you an idea of the sort of gender politics of the of the 1800s. Okay, most women who get it will suffer infection of the cervix uh, rather than the urethra. Okay. Um, if you get infected at other sites, very often you don't get a lot of symptoms. So in the throat or in the anus, you don't always get symptoms. You can, but not always. The most common symptoms are discharge from where your body sends white blood cells to fight it. They die and form. The problem is, if you don't get it treated, it can spread and go deep. Yeah, pelvic inflammatory disease, which can lead to serious damage to the reproductive system in women. It can lead to infertility. In men, it can lead to orchiditis, so infl inflammation of the testes. Epididymitis, again, inflammation of the back of the testes. And that can lead to infertility. It can also spread around the body. It can affect tendon sheaths. It can affect joints. And if you're a mother and you give birth and you have a gonorrhea infection, even without symptoms, and you give birth to a baby, the gonorrhea can get into the baby's eyes and cause ophthalmia neonatorum, which is quite a serious eye infection. Uh, and it is a, 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 one of the causes of reversible blindness worldwide. The only way to detect it is to look for the bacteria, so like we did in our patient, you take a swab, it and somebody like me looks at a microscope at it. Or you can use what we call nucleic acid amplification tests, PCR, basically, to look for its DNA. Or you can culture it, you can grow it. Growing it is really important because that's the only way currently to find out what antibiotics it senses. <laughs> A parte da cultura, na verdade, é a única forma para testar in vitro a resistência aos antibióticos, né? a sensibilidade. Então, a cultura sempre tem que fazer parte. Tá? Ok, moving on. Next slide. Give you an e... idea how big a problem this is. The World Health Organization estimated in 2012 there were 78 million new cases worldwide between, in people between the ages of 50 and 49. Now, that's based on disease reporting. There are a lot more cases than that, a lot more. In England, last year alone, so in 2018, there were 56,500 cases. I would like to apologize for writing my numbers in the English way where I use a comma, not a full stop for the decimal place. Sorry, but for the thousands. Um, but in England, simply between 2017 and 2018, we've had a 26% increase in cases. 26% in one year. It's a massive problem. And the issue, of course, is that we need to be able to detect all these cases and we need to be able to treat them. And the biggest problem in gonorrhea is treating it. It is a very hard disease to treat. Okay, next slide. The circle in front of you on the piece of paper is Andrew Roaring of gonorrhea. That is Neisseria gonorrhea. If you could make one large enough, you could look at it. It's a bacterium. It has all the features that you would expect from a gram-negative bacterium. The reason I am telling you about these is because the things I'm going to highlight on this slide are things that the antibiotics attack, kill it, and they're the things that the organism can change to not be killed. Okay? It has a cell wall. All bacteria have a cell wall. In this case, as a gram-negative organism, it has a very thin cell wall with a membrane either side of it. 
They have ribosomes, similar to yours, but smaller. They have DNA. They don't have a nucleus like your cells. They have a nucleoid. And they have plasmids, which are little circles of DNA that carry small arrays on them, mostly associated with enzymes for breaking things down. Okay. The problem with gonorrhea is that it has what we would say is a very plastic genome. Its genome is very prone to mutation. It's not very good at staying the same. It's got lots of repeating DNA sequences. It's got lots of bits of DNA that can jump around between different bits of the genome. Before 1937, I know what you're thinking, I wasn't born in 1937, even I wasn't. Before 1937, there was nothing you could treat gonorrhea with. There were lots of folk remedies people had. You could rub things on certain things. But there were no antibiotics. They simply didn't exist before 1937. In 1937, if you go to the next slide, you will see Andrew's five-slide history of drugs begins with a drug called fulvanilamide. Fulvanilamide was discovered by a German uh, named Gerhard Domak in 1936. Um, we don't talk about him very much because he worked for a company called IG Farben that, in addition to making antibiotics, also made hydrogen cyanide for gas chambers. Uh, and funnily enough, after World War II, they weren't very popular and had to change their name to Bayer Pharmaceuticals. We still talk about them, though. Um, Sulfonilamide was the Esse third... comentário eu não vou traduzir. <laughs> Sulfonilamide was the first ever really heavily marketed antibiotic, and it was the first thing we ever had against gonorrhea. Basically, to cut a lot, the, the mechanisms are boring if you're not a pharmacologist, but bacteria need to make folate, just like you do, okay? Folate is used to make DNA. They can't divide, the cell can't divide, the nuclei can't change without folate. You need it. Pregnant women need it, bacteria need it. There are two enzymes in bacteria that help them to make folate. One of them is called dihydrotoate synthase, dihydrotoate synthase, synthase but don't worry, the thing that says DHPS on the slide. Sulfonilamide stops that enzyme working. That enzyme can't work, the bacterium can't make folate, if it can't make folate, it can't divide. So we have our first ever drug that worked on gonorrhea. And unsurprisingly, lots of people ended up taking it. Sulfonilamide has two problems. One is it's horrible. It causes kidney problems, crystallizes out in the kidneys, forms stones, very unpleasant. And two, very quickly, we started to see that we were giving people sulfonilamide, but it wasn't curing their gonorrhea. And everybody quickly began to realize that it was because the bacterium was becoming resistant. The way that it does this is that there is a gene in the bacterium which codes for the HPS protein. And all that was happening was the bacteria was simply accumulating mutations in it. And as the protein became more and more and more misformed, the sulfonilamide couldn't bind to it anymore or bound less effectively. And it was taking higher and higher doses, sulfonilamide, to get the same effect. Eventually, very quickly, by the 1940s, simply didn't work. The bacteria could keep making folate, and it. This was a problem because there wasn't anything time. 80% by the 1940s of all people treated with sulfonilamide had no response to treatment. 
and we were happy to give them such huge doses that it was having lots of side effects, kidney problems, you know. You, may, you will spot, I have put on the slides, it's very useful to orientate you, I put, meanwhile, in Brazil. So for people who like Brazilian history, because uh, I got to get a lot of it whilst I was visiting this summer, um, actually, the, uh, Vargas, the dictator at the time, had established a new state against communists the same year that salt vanilla mice came onto the market. So there you go. They weren't really communists, he was just using it to keep him in power. Uh, I'm sure no other government in Brazil will ever create imaginary communists to keep themselves in power. I'm sure that won't happen again. Anyway. Certainly. Never. Never. Yeah, I, can, I, can do, I can do transatlantic, um, transatlantic political comedy as well. Um, OK, but the good news was, in 1943, in 1942, 1943, a drug was rediscovered called penicillin, specifically benzyl penicillin, or penicillin G, uh, as it's often referred to. Now, this is the one that everyone has heard of. Most people have heard of the story of how penicillin was discovered. I'm not going through all that. What matters is that any drug trying to get into these, these bacteria has a problem. The bacterium has a membrane around the outside of the cell, and a lot of drugs can't get through the membrane. Mycelia has little holes in the membrane, little porins, okay? Specifically called pore B1B, but you don't necessarily need to know that. But they're nice little holes, and hydrophobic drugs like benzyl penicillin go through the hole very nicely, which is useful. Penicillin is a beta-lactam drug. That means it stops the bacterium making its cell wall. So boring microbiology, I'm afraid. Um, cell walls, bacterial cell walls, are made of a molecule called peptidoglycan, or murine, sometimes known. And there are enzymes, little enzymes called penicillin binding proteins, that link the cell wall together and stop it from falling apart. Drugs like penicillin stop the penicillin binding proteins, the PBPs on the slides. If it can't stick its wall together, the wall falls apart, bacterium bursts like a balloon. And benzyl penicillin for 40 years was the first line treatment for gonorrhea. You had gonorrhea, you'd come in, you'd get an injection of benzyl penicillin penjin. It still is, in a lot of parts of the world, first line treatment for Neisseria meningitidis, the meningococcus. But there were problems. The first of which is that gonorrhea very quickly began to pick up enzymes that could break down penicillin, or penicillinase. It picks these up from other bacteria through the movement of plasmids between cells. It also began, just like with sulfonylamide, to get mutations, DNA sequences that coded for the penicillin binding protein, and they began to change shape. And the drugs couldn't bind to them anymore. And they began to get mutations in the genes that coded for the porins, the holes that the drug was going through in the first place, and the drugs couldn't get through as effectively. And we started to see the same problem. You had to give much more drug, get the cure, started to see people who wouldn't be cured with their penicillin, And in Brazil, World War II, um, government signed an agreement with the US president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to send Brazilian troops to fight in Europe. Brazilian troops came and fought in Italy during the Second World War. There you go. That was interesting. I didn't know that happened until I was researching this presentation. Will you, will you make any more political comments for Second World War? Can I leave the room? 
That's it. So can you be pleased to know that's the end of any comments about any of you doing that now? They were fighting Italians. I feel fine. I feel fine. <laughs> Back in, back in those days, antibi antibiotics, it was great because if something became resistant to something, we just invented a new one. And there were classes of drugs that came out that didn't work on the DNA, that didn't work on the cell wall. They worked on a different bit. They worked on the ribosomes. They stopped the protein synthesis. Tetracyclines that worked on the small components of the ribosome and macrolides like azithromycin that worked on the big subunits of the ribosome, the 50S part. But, unfortunately, as we continued to give patients these treatments instead, there is a pump protein that this gonorrhea has, which is capable of pumping out things that are causing it problems. In this case, things like macrolides and tetracyclines. There's a gene that prevents the bacterium from making it, a repressor gene called NTRR. The bacterium began to accumulate mutations in that, the gene was switched off, and they began to make more of these pumps. Again, same problem. Not only that, but they were able to accumulate plasmids from other bacteria, which allowed them to change part of the ribosome macrolides were binding to. Once they got those enzymes, the macrolides couldn't bind as well. You needed bigger doses. Same went for the small part of the ribosome. They began to accumulate plasmids from other bacteria that allowed them to change the small subunits and allowed them to become resistant to the tetracycline. So by the 1950s, when this was happening, resistance was already beginning to happen. And what we were seeing was resistance was happening much more quickly now, because the bacteria already that we were seeing had all of these mutations, and they were just adding new mutations. Meanwhile, in Rio, 1950 World Cup was happening. The Maracana was being built. There you go. I had to get football in there somewhere. These are good news. That's a lot better than the Second World War game. These are good news, yes. Yes. In 1983, 40 years after we started using it, uh, benzyl penicillin was discontinued as a therapy for gonorrhea. We stopped using it completely. And that was worldwide. Simply didn't work any. The use of drugs like azithromycin was restricted. So worldwide, stopping using. And the reason for this is because we found a new class of drugs called fluoroquinolones. Ciprofloxacin is one of the most popular drugs worldwide still. What it does is it blocks two enzymes that help the bacterium wind up its DNA. DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4. Ciprofloxacin stops them, bacterium can't coil its DNA, and it can't replicate. Unsurprisingly, you can guess what happened. Genes that coded for the enzymes that were being stopped by ciprofloxacin, bacteria was accumulating mutations, the enzymes changed their shape, and ciprofloxacin couldn't bind as effective. And by the 1990s, we started to see clinical treatment failure with the new drug, ciprofloxacin. At the same time as ciprofloxacin was coming on the market, the new democratically elected natural, National Constituent Assembly in Brazil put down their first recommendations for national constitution, which enshrined the public health and the health of the civilian population as being the government's responsibility, fundamental underpinning of your SUS these days. Okay? So fluoroquinolones arrived at exactly the same time as that document. Of course, was ratified in 18. You can thank Professor Carlos for that. So, um, so we were running out of options. All of these drugs that we all these great drugs,
were not working anymore. And the last thing we had in the cupboard were third generation cephalosporin drugs, specifically cefraxone and cefixine. Now, these work very similar to penicillin, but they have a big advantage. Those mutated penicillin binding proteins, cephalosporins are a lot less picky about binding to things. So, mutating your, your penicillin binding proteins, PPPs, these third generation cephalosporins can still bind to them and inhibit them. Additionally, they are also very resistant to penicillinases. Okay? So it was great. We had a therapy that worked really well. And cetriaxone is still, to this day, in most parts of the world, the number one therapy for gonorrhea. You have to inject it. You can't take it as a pill. Okay? But you can give one big dose, and that should cure it. But in the 2000s, at the turn of the century, we began to see our first needs for increased doses move towards treatment failure. And it turned out that even though cefriaxone can bind to those mutant enzymes, what happened was the bacteria were simply getting so many mutations in the gene, they were producing all of these mosaics as we call them, of these penicillin binding proteins. And cefriaxone simply couldn't inhibit all of them. Eventually, the bacterium would hit on a solution where the, the drug wouldn't bind. But even in 1990, when Brazil was having its first democratic presidential elections, um, we're already starting to see the bacterium take care of this. And this is when the problem really exploded. Right, I, prom I promise that's all of the pharmacology out of the way. So if you think, between 1937 and everything that came before that, gonorrhea was untreatable. If you had it, you had to deal with the fact you'd get, you might become infertile, you would almost certainly pass it on to your sexual partners, all the problems that you associate with an untreated gonorrhea infection. 1937, we got sulfonilamide. By the end of the 30s, sulfonilamide wasn't working. In the 1940s, we got penicillin. Resistance appeared very quickly, and by 1983, it didn't work. Every drug that we came up with, the bacterium became resistant to it. And we are now at a point, globally, where there are strains of this bacterium that cannot be treated with antibiotic. We have extensively drug-resistant and totally drug-resistant gonorrhea. Why? Why has this happened? We're nearly on the last slide. The Western Pacific region, so the World Health Organization, everyone's familiar with that, I'm assuming, divides the world up into several different regions. One of them is the Western Pacific region. It, there's an A and a B part. But if you look at the list, you'll see this co covers countries like Japan, Singapore, Cambodia, China, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, the People's Republic of Korea, and Vietnam. These countries are all linked by several things. First of which is that a lot of these countries, you can go into a pharmacist and buy almost anything you like over the counter with no prescription. Don't need a script. Go in and go, I'll have that. Here's some money. So people can treat whatever they like themselves. That's bad. The recommendations for treatment in these countries were long-term, low-dose antibiotics. And they still are. It's very popular to give somebody drugs for a long period of time because culturally, people feel that having something for a long time is a good thing. It shows that healthcare is doing something. These are also parts of the world where lots of long distance cargo drivers, ships, lorries, you name it, planes, travel through these areas from all over the rest of the world, especially Europe, especially North Africa. And what happens is people go there, 
and they've driven their lorry 8,000 miles, so they decide that they will celebrate by having a drink, getting a tattoo, and having sex with something. In addition, these are also parts of the world where people go for what we call sex tourism. So people travel to the Far East to have sex with. They are also parts of the world where you can look at the list of countries and think about ones I have seen on the news recently and think about a lot of these countries. Papua New Guinea is a very good example at the moment. Conflict, population displacement, and people moving around. Now, I know you've already had some stuff about the impact that moving people around the world has on the spread of disease. These are parts of the world because of that, where people don't often have an opportunity to report for STI testing. They don't have an opportunity where we can do antimicrobial resistance testing, where the reporting of disease is lower. Japan has become a sort of, a, 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 I'm trying to think of a polite way of putting it, it was the epicentre of the totally drug-resistant gonorrhea. The first cases were reported in Japan. And this was because Japan did not licence cetriaxone for treating gonorrhea. So they continue to use oral regime, regimes of cefixine, which don't work as well. They were also one of the first places to adopt ciprofloxacin for use in the 1990s. And again, they, they very much favoured this idea of having low-dose treatments for a long period of time. If people were taking antibiotics, they didn't really need. And they were the first country to show extensively drug-resistant gonorrhea. So, the question is, why does this matter? Why is all this a problem? Because we talked about lots of parts of the world, okay? People going to areas where we know there's a lot of drug resistance and then coming back from them. Gentlemen, in the case at the start, have been to Australia and come back. The idea that you can travel from Australia to the United Kingdom in 24 hours, 100 years ago, would have been mind-blowing. Now, nobody thinks about it. I could fly to see you guys and be in Botticatu this time tomorrow if I was lucky with planes and everything else. So I could be on the other side of that webcam. Now, if I've got something that I'm bringing with me that I don't know I've got, it comes too. And again, I know Prof. Alexandre has talked about this to you at length. But in March 2018, in England... Just like our case at the start, a man went to a sexual health clinic with a gonorrhea infection. He had a partner in the UK, and he was a long-distance lorry driver who had just come back from Southeast Asia where he had had sex with one individual. We found, just like we did with our patient at the start, that he had gonorrhea, and we started him on oral azithromycin and an injection of cetriaxone. It didn't work. Didn't get better. So he came back. When we, the microbiology teams, tested, we found that the concentration of drug required to kill the bacterium was pretty much off the end of what we could measure. So it was totally resistant. So we started him on a drug called spectinomycin, which is the only drug we really got if you have an, a, a gonorrhea infection that can't be treated with anything we, we currently license. Spectinomycin is not a nice drug. You don't want to have to take it. Okay, There are a lot of side effects. It's, we, we, we don't use it routinely because it's not very pleasant to take. When he came back for his test of cure, his urethra was clear, but his throat, his pharynx, still showed the bacteria. 
and that was consistent with a treatment failure. He hadn't gone out and got gonorrhea again, okay? It was the same gonorrhea he had originally. Now, at that point, it's determined as untreatable. Literally, we would have to have said to this man, we can't help you, sorry. Luckily for him, microbiology looked back at an antibiotic called ertapenem. When we looked at all of his test results again, we couldn't definitely say sensitive or resistant for ertapenem, but it looked like it, there was a low concentration needed to inhibit the bacteria. So we admitted him to hospital and gave him ertapenem intravenously at the highest safe dose we could give him for three days. And at the end of three days, the gonorrhea had gone. But whilst this was happening, our public health teams were on the lookout to try and find out who else he'd been in contact with. And two people in Australia were reported as having the same strain of gonorrhea. One of them had been in Southeast Asia at roughly the same time as he had. And so likely his contact in Southeast Asia was a sex worker and they both had sex with the same sex worker and that's where they picked it up from. But the other person in Australia had never left Australia and had no contact with either of them at all. And that meant that the totally drug resistant, almost totally drug resistant gonorrhea was already in Australia and hadn't been brought back from Southeast Asia by that gentleman who'd come back. It was already there. And that meant there were people walking around with asymptomatic infections, didn't even know they'd got a potentially totally untreatable gonorrhea. So, we have a few minutes. It would be nice if, I, I think most of you are still awake. That's, that's good going for one of my rest. It would be nice, just go through a couple of points, just to make sure that everyone's on the right page. So the first question I would ask is, why do you think gonorrhea spreads so quickly and so easily? What do you think the biggest factors are? Pode ser em português. Qual seria um dos fatores? Por que que, por que, que Godonré consegue se espalhar tão fácil? Sexualmente transmissível, solitaria, bastante. Hábitos, principalmente na mulher, né? Women, women have almost no symptoms. You have, what they're saying, you have... Uh, um, uh, you have the lack uh, for symptoms, and uh, uh, if you have, if you have, uh, well, when you have the contamination, until you have the first symptoms, you have this time lag where you can where you can transmit the disease. Yeah, absolutely. The asymptomatic nature of, especially for, especially for women. It's very different. In chlamydia, it tends to be men who are very asymptomatic and women nearly always get symptoms. So it's very much the other way around. I could spend a long time talking about biology. But, um, but yeah, absolutely. However, there's another couple of reasons why it spreads. Why else do you think these well, gonorrhea especially, but could argue that for HIV, syphilis, chlamydia. What do you think? What what is it that's causing it to spread? What do you have to do to get it? Sex. I always have this. I always have this problem with our medical students. They get so shy about sex. Um, who has sex? I don't. I'm not asking for show of hands. I'm talking more generally. 
who has sex? In a general way. In a general way. What people in the world have sex? Right. Most people? Okay. How many people do you think go through their entire life and never have sex with anybody? You would think? I think we'd say there's not a lot of those people, are there? Difficult to find, yes. <laughs> yeah, it would be quite hard to find people who don't have sex. You would, you would need to look in very specific places. I know you're thinking, I don't know, ugly people, maybe they don't. Um, but seriously, well, people have sex. Why is that a problem? And what can you do if you are having sex to your likelihood of transmitting a sexually transmitted infection? Qual a melhor prevenção das doenças sexualmente transmissíveis? The use of condoms. Yeah. And what do you think one of the big problems we have since somebody came up with the idea... Well, well, sorry, I'll ask a different question. Why do most people use a condom? What are you trying to stop? Pregnancy. Yeah. Nobody wants to get pregnant unless they want to get pregnant, okay? And people wear condoms to stop pregnant. They want to how, else, yes. how else can you stop from getting pregnant and still have sex? Bolinha pequena que o Alexandre falou, como chama mesmo? Anticonceptional. Yeah. The pill. The coil in the uterine devices. There are male hormonal injections, apparently, they're bringing out now. They're going to start doing that. They did invent a male <laughs> contraceptive pill, uh, but they had to take it off the market because the men they... T well, they had to take it out of trials because the men they gave it to complained that they were getting mood swings and hot flushes, and they didn't like having that, uh, so they, they couldn't cope with it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the problem is if you use those kind of contraceptive devices, they won't stop you getting an STI. And actually, around the world, people are getting worse at using condoms because they don't need them to stop them from getting pregnant. So one, the reason it's spreading is yes, it might spread because you're asymptomatic. But two, people aren't having sex. People that haven't stopped having sex. Three, well, let's be honest, People aren't very good at using condoms. And actually, the people who are worst at using condoms are people in your age range. Round the world. So, if I cannot treat your gonorrhea infection, what do you think the biggest problems you would face are? If you had gonorrhea that I couldn't treat, the biggest problem of that? Qual é o maior problema? Se eu tenho uma pessoa que eu não consigo tratar, I will contaminate other people with this, with an untreatable yes. Absolutely. So. It could also, I mean, obviously, you've got the, the ongoing health effects, you know, of infertility, you know, having to constantly wash your underwear because of all the discharge, you know. But actually, yeah, it's not just passing it on. Do you think somebody's going to want to have sex with you if you have an untreatable gonorrhea infection? Probably not. I don't know. As a chat-up line, next time you're on a night out, try it at the bar and see how quickly people move away from you. Okay, that's actually a big problem. Health is about more than just not being ill. A healthy sex life, for a lot of people, is part of their mental well-being. For most young people, it's the only thing on their bloody minds. Okay, if you were told, sorry,
sorry, actually, you can't have sex with anybody for 24 months whilst we wait and see if your body manages to clear this out. That's a big impact on someone. Also, in the meantime, you might become infertile. You might get serious tendonitis. You might have an eye infection that makes you go blind. That's a, that's a pretty big problem. The question is, I know this is a problem in England. I know we have patients where we struggle to treat them. We've just changed all our prescribing guidelines. Is it a problem in Brazil? Do we know this? I'm blowing people's minds. He don't know. That's it. No. He don't know. But I think we have to figure this out. I, I, I really don't know what's the real resistance uh, uh, level in, in Brazil. They have to figure this out because... That's the old question of how many spiders are in your house. Don't know until you go looking for them. Okay? So, I appreciate you guys having spiders in your house is a lot more scary than when I have spiders in my house. Our spiders don't bite us. Okay? But this is the question, and actually, for you guys doing global health, it's all very well to look around the rest of the world and go, oh, look, Japan has got totally drug-resistant gonorrhea, and England's got extensively drug-resistant gonorrhea. But actually, if you don't know the domestic situation in your own healthcare, in Sao Paulo, in Botticatu, or in the whole of Brazil, in South America, then it makes it very difficult, because people we already know don't stay in one place. Because my question for you guys to take away, really, not to dis is what, what are you, the doctors of the future, who are going to be seeing these people coming in, what can you do to try and reduce this at the local level, at the national level, at the international level? And that, I think, is the question, really, from this, that you have to take away. This little bacterium that is about two thousandths of a millimetre across and become resistant to anything. So how do you get on top of this problem, given that you can't say to everybody, please stop having sex? You go on television and say that, you'll become very unpopular. Okay? It doesn't work. <laughs> and it will not work. But actually, there are international plans to actually surveil gonococcal resistance to find out what's going on. But this is a health problem that is global. If I come to visit you in Brazil, and whilst I'm down there, decide to go for a night out, get a tattoo, and have sex with somebody. And I have brought with me an asymptomatic gonorrhea infection. I have left a public health problem for you to deal with. And how many people travel from and to Brazil every single day? How many people travel to the United States, Britain? Europe, the Far East, every single day. As Prof. Alexandre said to you, this is a massive problem. People are moving around the planet faster than we ever have and going to places you never visited before. So I think that well, if you were to have a takeaway point to think about as you go and eat your lunch that I've kept you, that would be the one I would... Okay? And that's me. Okay. Okay. Hopefully one will choose this and present some solution or some ideas, some inspirations. Yeah, uh, you've got about three or four weeks to save the world. Okay? No pressure. Yes. We will save the world. Yes. Yes. 
No, there is just a, a, a comic form. Two, two, two smaller reds. I, I, I... Pink and the brain. What will yeah. we do to them? Dominate the world. Yeah. I yes. remember Pinky and the brain. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Certainly. Yes. Um, is, um, I, hope, I, say, I hope that was. I hope that was at least vaguely interesting to some of you. I know it's difficult with my rapid speech uh, in a completely foreign language. But uh, thank you all for listening. Okay, yeah. Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it was very very good. Anybody had any difficulties in understanding? No. Okay. Okay, I think we will improve our interactions for sure. I'll try, I'll try and learn more Portuguese. I'll try and learn more Portuguese. Honest. Yes, for next year. I think it is an yeah. absolutely yeah. must. Yes. I'll be, I'll be yes. fluent by next year. Yes. Yes. You you will have a, almost six months. Yeah. For the next for the next meeting that will be in March, isn't it? Yes, that'll be for the, the synchronous learning. Which yes. we'll meet up the meeting about in the very near future. Right. Okay. Well, well, thank you all working. very much. Okay. So thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. Much. Yes. Thank you. Bye. And, yeah, yes, and you've got Eva in two weeks. Yes. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>